And we are live. Great. Let's see people starting to join us. So we'll just wait a one or two minutes to it, uh, <clears throat> and we'll get started. Max, can you unlock it so I can interact with everyone via chat? Sure. Great, right, thanks. Okay, get close here, start to level off. Start here in just a second. There we go. Thank you, Max. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everybody. Depending on where you might be from, I am Rob Burgess, and I head up business development for Sino Biological. And it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you all to our next installment in our Lock and Key Immunodetection Webinar Series. We have a very exciting and esteemed speaker from a company called Redshift Bio today. I think you're going to find the topic and the talk very intriguing and interesting. And I'll introduce the speaker in just a minute. We just have one housekeeping issue that I want to talk about really for just a second, and that is I ask everyone who has questions for the speaker, if you can type those questions into the chat box. We're going to withhold all those questions until the end of the seminar and lecture, and then I will run through the chat box and verbally ask each one of our speakers. And so with that, without further ado, it is my Pleasure to introduce to you Dr. David Sloan as our speaker for today's webinar series. Dr. Sloan is the Vice President of Project, I'm sorry, Vice President of Product Management and Applications at Redshift Bio. He has worked in the biotechnology industry for the last 20 years, and he has always focused primarily on customer satisfaction. Dr. Sloan received his PhD from Duke University Medical Center in the Department of Pharmacology and Cancer Biology and studied protein-protein interactions there with the goal of identifying novel therapeutics. Dr. Sloan also received his bachelor degree from Cornell University with dual degrees in both biology and chemistry. And the title of Dr. Sloan's talk today is Microfluidic Modulation Spectroscopy a technology platform for ultra-sensitive analysis of proteins from structure to activity. So with that, Dr. Sloan, I'll turn the screen sharing over to you and thank you for your time today. We look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Rob. I appreciate it. Thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm looking forward to talking to you and I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna divide my talk into two halves. I'm going to talk a little bit about our technology, which we call microfluidic modulation spectroscopy, which is used for looking at protein structure, specifically protein secondary structure. The second half of my talk is going to look at three different case studies where we're looking at a few different proteins and the types of questions that we can answer, the types of questions we can address with microfluidic modulation spectroscopy. And one of the things I'm particularly interested in with this talk is I was able to purchase a couple of samples from Sinobiological. So we're gonna be looking at three different proteins. We're looking at three different proteins from the calocrine family of proteins that we chose to analyze as one of our case studies. So without any further ado, I'm just gonna dive right in. Um, I'm just gonna dive right in here. What is Redshift Bio? Who is Redshift Bio? We are a biotech company that's based outside of uh, Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. 
We're a venture funded biotech company. And we are, all of our products are really based on this microfluidic modulation spectroscopy. What is microfluidic modulation spectroscopy? It is a technique that gives us high sensitivity to look at proteins or really biomolecules in general under very native or natural conditions. It lets us assess the secondary structure of those biomolecules. Our newest instrument, which was launched about a year ago, is the Apollo instrument. It's also powered by the software. It's proprietary software, it's called Delta. And what it allows people to do is it allows people to understand higher order structure. It allows people to look at IR spectroscopy without being spectroscopy specialists. You don't have to be deep in the IR world. You don't have to really understand a whole lot about protein spectroscopy to be able to use the Apollo instrument and the Delta software. Jumping ahead, we are involved in biophysical characterization. As far as proteins are concerned and as far as structure is concerned, there's really four basic levels of protein structure. There's primary, which is the amino acid sequence, there's secondary structure, which are the alpha helices, beta sheets, and turns, which are really the foundation for the whole structure of the molecule. There's tertiary structure, as what people usually call the crystal structure or the three-dimensional structure. It's how those various secondary structural elements come together to form the whole intact protein. And then there's quaternary structure. Quaternary structure is really all about proteins that have different subunits and how those subunits interact together. What I've listed on this slide is I've listed some of the common techniques and tools that are used for measuring these different levels of protein structure. I'm sure many of these different tools will be common and familiar to you. Where I'm gonna be focusing from this talk is I'm really gonna be looking in at protein secondary structure. The historical tools are circular dichroism, and FTIR or Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. There are some challenges associated with both CD and FTIR, and that's really where MMS or microfluidic modulation spectroscopy comes in, and that's where the Apollo instrument comes in. MMS solves a lot of the challenges that are associated with those two historical techniques. Just on a very high level, which I'll dive into as we move forward, uh, MMS has broad buffer compatibility, has a very wide dynamic range from low sample concentrations to extremely high sample concentrations, and it is completely automated. So it's got a very user-friendly uh, workflow when it comes to running the system, when it comes to generating data. To start with a couple of quotes, a couple of comments, Many of our users are biopharma and CDMO customers, though you'll see in a couple slides, we have academic customers as well. We have a reagent supplier customers. We've got a wide customer base. This comes from two somewhat recent publications, one from Pfizer, one from Amgen. Both are using MMS in their biologic drug programs. Pfizer in their program said, changes or loss of or alterations in higher order structure have really important effects on the biomolecule, on their biologic drugs, and they need to understand what's happening with those biologics, with the secondary structure, under the conditions in which the drug is formulated. They need to understand if there's aggregation, if there are stability concerns, because those can both implement, those can both interact or result in higher immunogenicity or actually loss of function of that biologic drug. Amgen historically used FTIR, they're transitioning away to using MMS. And the reason is they've got some drugs with very high potency, so they need to be used at low concentrations, which is a struggle for FTIR. And they also like to look at different buffers, and it's the wide buffer compatibility of MMS that really enhanced what they were able to do and enhanced their confidence in the various drugs and molecules that they were putting through clinical trials and testing. Large adoption, this is just a snapshot of some of our customers that are out there, Biopharma, CDNO, CDMO, sorry, a few uh, academics, a lot of different people, a lot of different uses, lots of different applications of MMS. 
what is it all about? There are four key components that go into MMS and the Apollo system. The first is we utilize a high powered quantum cascade laser. This gives us about a 30 fold increase in sensitivity and the ability to see very small structural changes. MMS or Apollo can go from about 0.5 mg per ml all the way up to about 200 mg per ml for protein concentrations that we're looking at on the system. We can look at very low concentrations earlier in the drug development process. We can look at high concentrations. We can look at formulation concentrations for really understanding what the molecule looks like under the conditions where it's being stored and where it will be administered. As I mentioned, it's fully automated. We have both 24 and 96 well plates for whatever throughput level you may have. It is a load up the plate, hit the big green go button and walk away. The system analyzes all of your samples and gives you higher order structural information, gives you similarity information, gives you the information you're looking for directly in the software without a lot of expertise required and without a lot of training required. It's a very user-friendly system. We, uh, we of course offer full training, but it's really about one and a half days of training and people have a lot of confidence. They're up and running. They're ready to do what they need to do. They don't need a lot of background information, but we're always there to support our users as well if any challenges arise at, while they're looking at different molecules or different types of proteins. The last key to the system is a microfluidic flow cell. One of the challenges with IR spectroscopy is there's water absorption, there's very strong water absorption in the amide one band, which is where most people are looking for protein secondary structure. Our microfluidic flow cell allows us to do a real time buffer subtraction or real time background referencing. So we're able to subtract out the signal from water, we're able to subtract out any signals that might exist from any formulation buffers, from any complex excipients, from any additive that might be present in that sample. Again, it allows us to look at your samples under the conditions that you care about. Look at your samples in formulation buffer, at formulation concentration, under the conditions where they're going to be most stable or most interesting for looking at. What are some of the benefits? What does that really get us? We use a quantum cascade laser, some of the specifics about the quantum cascade laser, but what it really means is we have sensitivity to see super small structural changes. And I'm gonna highlight in my case studies how sometimes very small structural changes are really critical to the activity of a protein or really critical to the performance of what that protein or enzyme might be doing. What's infrared spectroscopy all about? It gives you structural inf information. It gives you secondary structure. It tells you about the higher order structure, the alpha helices, the beta sheet, the turns and the disordered regions that might be present in your protein and how those secondary structural elements might be changing based on stresses that are applied, based on formulation, based on storage, based on concentration, or based on mutations that may be made in those proteins to enhance or modify its function. Last but not least, it is that real-time referencing or real-time background subtraction that gives you precise, repeatable, and accurate measurements every time you do them. We have great day-to-day -day repeatability. We have great user-to-user -user repeatability because it's a completely automated system. All the user has to do is pipette it into the place and the instrument handles everything else. It's very hard to... Uh, make any changes that are going to disrupt your measurement or cause changes in your measurement. What happens? This is a little cartoon. This is a, a cartoon of our flow cell. On our flow cell, there's two channels. There's the sample, and then there's the buffer. When you hit the start button, the flow cell fills up. The channel fills up with your buffer. The software or the system takes some background measurements. Then after it has its background measurements, what it starts to do is it modulates or alternates back and forth between your sample and your buffer. And at each modulation, it generates a differential absorbance across the amide one region, which is the 1600 to 1700 wave number region, which is the region that's most, import, most um, informative for protein secondary structure. So it goes back and forth, 
generating high quality data across the amide one and removing any background signals, any water signals, any buffer signals that might have. What does that get you? What do you do with that? Well, there's five key measurements or five critical measurements that are all part of the Apollo system. Aggregation, quantitation, stability, similarity, and structure. There are other tools out there that are all part of the biophysical toolbox that can give you some of these measurements. And really in many cases, our users are using multiple tools to paint a whole picture about what their molecule might look like, what their protein might look like, how their protein might be changing. I'm gonna start off with structure, because that's really what we're all about. Structure is all about function, or maybe function is all about structure, it's highly interrelated. And it's really important to characterize the higher order structure both so you understand your molecule, understand how it's changing, but it's also critical from a perspective of any sort of a new drug application or a biological license application that one might be putting out there because you have to have structural information as part of it. From a similarity, this could be manufacturing. It could be lot to lot. It could be transferring your manufacturing from a pharma to a CDMO. It could be part of a biosimilar study. If you're looking to make a biosimilar and you want to understand if the structure of your biosimilar is similar to the innovator molecule, MMS and Apollo are really great at making that measurement and giving you that type of information. A lot of people are doing different uh, stability studies as well as it relates to aggregation. Additionally, stability could be thermal stability. It could be chemical stability. There's a bunch of different stability tests which the FDA mandates in terms of shaking stability and light stability and accelerator. There's all goes together in temperature. So we give a stability and aggregation assessment as well as part of the structure. We're easily able to measure the native beta sheets as well as the non-native intermolecular beta sheets, which are a hallmark of aggregation. We also happen to get a quantitation measurement as well, just as part of the analysis, we do get a quantitation. It's not based on OD280. It's, a, it's an intrinsic property of the IR spectroscopy that we're doing. So it's really just a secondary confirmation that mistakes haven't been made, that nothing was diluted the wrong way, that it is the concentration that you think you're getting. A couple of the other things I pointed out before, easy to use very wide dynamic range from about 0.1 mg per ml all the way up to 200. We, are, we do have reproducibility at greater than 98%. So we are able to see very small structural changes, small changes that may be critical to your protein's function, to your protein's stability, to the lifetime of the protein for whatever activity it might be being used for. We also have super high sensitivity. We are able to see a very small addition or a very small fraction of a structural change, which is the earliest indications of a problem, an early indication that something might be going wrong with your protein, with your formulation, with your study that you're looking at. These are just a few different areas that are all critical to structural analysis, structure activity, conformational changes as part of protein-protein interactions or ligand binding, we have a lot of people who are looking at formulation and manufacturability and capability. Aggregation is a super important issue when it comes for comes to submitting a drug application, understanding what might be going on. I mentioned batch to batch reproducibility as well from a QC application. But really, it's all about understanding the higher order structure, measuring that secondary structure, which is the earliest indication that something might be going wrong or that everything's going right and that you do have a full handle on what's going on with your drug, what's going on with your molecule, what's going on with your food additive that you're looking to put out there. Because we're on newer technology, we've been out there for about four years now, we often get compared to other techniques as well, compared to FTIR, sometimes we get compared to X-ray crystallography, we get compared to NMR as well. Publication, just looking at comparing various different proteins with different secondary structural tools or structural tools that are out there. By and large, there's very good agreement between MMS and the other structural tools that people are using. There are some examples, notably X-ray isn't really a liquid 
isn't really measuring the structure in liquid. It's in a crystal, it's in a semi-solid form. So sometimes there'll be some differences between FTIR and MMS as compared to X-ray, just because of the difference between a solid structure or a solid protein and a protein in a liquid environment. I mentioned the automation, it's just really a picture of the instrument. You can see you plate, place your 96 well plate in a carrier, the carrier goes in the instrument, you close the little red door and then the instrument handles everything beyond that. 24 and, and 96 well plates, automated cleaning, minimal user interaction, everything's controlled by the computer, you just get your data at the end. We have the ability to chill the plates if people have, st have stability concerns about leaving multiple proteins on the deck on the instrument while the instrument is processing, while the samples are being analyzed. And there's automated washes and cleanup at the end. So the instrument is really always ready for you when you're ready to run your samples. A real quick walkthrough on the software, then we're gonna get into our case studies. This is just a quick thermal analysis, thermal denaturation of BSA. This is really the raw data, the differential absorbance that the software is generating. You don't need to interact with the differential absorbance. The software is just gonna take that data and process it further. You can see right off the bat that there's large spectral changes caused by the thermal stress that we're applying to our BSA. There's decreases at some wave regions, increases at other wave regions that we're looking at. This was also a concentration study. We tested at 1, 20, and 100 mg per ml just to work across the larger dynamic range of MMS. The differential absorbance is normalized for concentrations. So there's no concentration artifacts that might be going on in there. We then calculate a second derivative of it. The second derivative highlights small changes in structure. It allows you to see more of what's going on. We then generate a similarity plot, which is really just the inverse of the second derivative plot. And from that, we can, again, highlight where the structure is changing. We can then fit that to a family of Gaussian curves, which is really well established across, let's say, 50 years of IR spectroscopy experience, which gives you the higher order structure or the helices, turns, beta sheets, and unordered regions. Just to highlight in this particular study, you can see as we're going through the temperature ramp, as we're ramping up in temperature, there's a decrease in alpha helical structure. BSA is predominantly alpha helical. There's an increase in intermolecular or non-native beta sheet, non-native beta sheet, which is a hallmark of aggregation. We are watching the BSA aggregate as we're ramping across temperature. Another way of looking at it is a difference plot, and it just does a good job of highlighting the exact wave regions where things are changing. We can then plot this on a stability plot, which is temperature versus just change in structure or second derivative of the spectrum. And you can see there's a decrease in alpha helical content starting about 60 couple degrees. And that's coupled with an increase in the intermolecular or non-native beta sheet at a same temperature as the BSA is aggregating. What does this really mean? What's it all about? Why would someone want to include MMS in their analysis? We are part of the biophysical toolbox. Many of our customers are also looking at SEC and DLS, just looking for overall size changes in their protein, not structure, but is the protein changing in size? Is there perhaps a colloidal aggregation that's going on alongside a structural-based aggregation that MMS can detect? DSC for a straight up thermal ramp, mass spec for primary structure, and NMR if you do wanna do another structural tool, but many labs are not running NMR. That's usually a core facility. That's usually something that's being sent out. I'm now gonna turn over and I'm gonna to go towards more of our applications. I'm just gonna talk about a couple of quick case studies in this webinar. We have many application notes available. Website is shown here many different topics, many different aspects that we look at. Some of them are our own research, many of them are done in collaboration with our customers. As I hinted at at the top of the call, one of my case studies is gonna be looking at three different proteins that synobiological cells. There are three different calocrines, KLK1, KLK3, and KLK7. They go by some other names as well, catalog numbers, great proteins, really easy to work with, very happy with what was sent to us. 
A little bit of background on the calocrines, they're serine proteases. They all have a conserved catalytic triad of histidine, aspartic acid, and serine. It's highlighted in the overlay of the various different calocrines in this loop, in this loop diagram. Many of them have trypsin-like or chymotrypsin-like activity. They're also structurally related to the chymotrypsins. They have a chymotrypsin fold comprised of two beta barrels. Each has six beta strands within it. And there's three loops that are between those uh, beta strands or beta barrels. These proteins are predominantly beta sheet proteins, which I didn't specifically mention it, but that does cause a real problem for anyone who's doing CD spectroscopy or circular dichroism. Circular dichroism is very good at looking at helical structures, not great at looking at beta sheets. There's not a big beta sheet signal in the CD region. Let's look at the proteins in a little more depth. KLK7, 1, and 3, just a quick little overview of them. They differ in their cleavage site when the proteins are activated. I will mention these were the precursors. These were the inactive precursors. These were not cleaved, but they have different cleavage sites, will, which will result in the active products being slightly different sizes. They do have different sequences, so they do have different post-translational modifications as well. Those post-translational modifications may play a role in their activity, and I'll get to their activity in a slide or two. I mentioned I like ribbon diagrams. These are just three different ribbon diagrams of those three different proteins, and you can see they're very structurally similar. They do have that chymotrypsin fold with the two beta barrels, and then the little um, uh, turns that are surrounding those and a couple of very short little helical stretches that are also part of the molecule. From a sequence standpoint, from an amino acid sequence standpoint, there's a very high level of identity between them. Pelocrine 1 and 3 are more similar with about 60% sequence identity. Pelocrine 7 is a little bit lower identity. It's about 40% identical to both Pelocrine 1 and Pelocrine 3. So there's a little, they fall into maybe two groups of calocrine seven, and then one and three are more structurally or more sequence base related to each other. Um, and we'll get more into what the structure might be after we talk about those, or we'll get, after we generate some data, I'll show you more what the structures, structural differences might be between these three proteins. What do they do from an activity? KLK1 has both triptych and chymotrypsin activity, KLK3 and seven, really only have chymotrypsin activity. So interestingly enough, one and three are more sequence related, but three and seven are more activity related. As far as the MMS analysis, as far as what we did, we dialyzed them into PBS just so they were all in the same buffer before we did our analysis. We measured everything at right about one mg per ml. And the overall goal was to look at the MMS results, compare them to some of the crystal structures, to ask the question, can we see structural differences between these three highly related proteins? And what do we know about the activity or what does that perhaps indicate about the activity of these three proteins? First result, some of the data that I showed you before, we're looking at the absolute absorbance and right off the bat, it's easy to tell there are spectral differences between these three molecules. Sometimes proteins are really highly related and it's hard to see differences in the absolute absorbance, but in this case, it's not. There are very clear differences between these three proteins. When we do take that second, um, second derivative to look at our, uh, our differential, our uh, second derivative plot, you can see that there's a very big difference between calocrine seven shown in the burgundy or the dark red color and one in three, which are more sequence similar and structurally more similar as well. You can see the largest change is coming in this beta sheet region, maybe not super surprising because this is a predominantly beta sheet protein as well. Where do we go from there? What do we do with the spectral information? We can generate a difference plot. This is our delta plot. We have normalized or we've set KLK7 kind of as our standard. This is based on its repeatability. Any spectral lines, that go outside of the hashed lines are statistically significant differences. This is based on the repeatability of the sample of the data that we got for KLK7. And it's clear that KLK1 and KLK3 uh, are statistically different in their beta sheet regions and a little bit of the unordered regions as well. 
from a higher order structure perspective, you can see that there's slightly more beta sheet in KLK7, again, in the dark red color. There's slightly less unordered regions and slightly more turn structure as compared to KLK1 and KLK3. This is just a similarity table that I'm showing. I'm showing the similarity three different ways. In the first one, I'm comparing KLK3 to KLK1 and KLK7 to KLK1. And then I go through and do them individual in the other two combinations as well. What we can see is that KLK1 and 3 are each approximately 80% similar from a structural perspective to KLK7. And we can also see that KLK3 is just under 10%, maybe about 9% different from KLK1, again, from a structural perspective. Just to put it in perspective, um, this is a relatively large structural difference. We are routinely able to see two, three, sometimes 4% structural changes between the proteins that we're looking at. And in my third example that I'm gonna show, we're really able to see activity differences in a molecule based on about 2% structural differences. So we are able to see very small, much smaller than this structural changes. And sometimes those small structural changes are really critical to differences in activity. So going on from there, again, these are our ribbon diagrams. These are the higher order structure for the three calocrines that we're looking at based on MMS. And just to compare it to PDB, virtual molecular dynamic simulations, this is the higher order structure for the same three proteins from X-ray as compared to the higher order structure for the three calocrines looking at MMS or looking on the Apollo system. You can see in general, there's a lot of comparability. It's a predominantly beta sheet protein with some turns between the sheets, very similar to what we're seeing, beta sheet protein with turns between those sheets, smaller amounts of unordered and alpha helical regions. And just in a kind of specific sense, calocrine 7 does have the highest amount of beta sheet, both as, both as seen in the X-ray crystal structure, as well as on measured within the MMS technology. I mentioned these were all, they all had a chymotrypsin fold. What we then did is we ran chymotrypsinogen, which is the inactive precursor of chymotrypsin. In a few slides, I'll also go ahead and compare chymotrypsinogen to the active chymotrypsin. But in this case, I wanted to give a structural overview of the three calocrines, as well as chymotrypsinogen. You can see they're all members of the same family, the same double beta barrel, six beta strand form protein with a couple of turn structures around it. If you compare it on MMS, overall, there's a pretty similar looking structure in general, pretty similar looking higher order structure across all the proteins that we're looking at. Somewhat interestingly to note, KLK1 and KLK3 are more structurally similar to chymotrypsinogen than they are to KLK7. KLK7 is less similar to KLK1 and 3 than chymotrypsinogen is to KLK1 and 3, even though KLK1, 3, and 7 are all members of that calocrine family of proteins. Some of the conclusions from that study, KLK7 had the highest percentage of beta sheets. 1 and 3 have the highest structural similarity as well as the highest sequence similarity, amino acid sequence similarity. KLK1 happened to have the highest alpha helical content of them. And as I mentioned, one and three are more structurally similar than, than one and seven or three and seven are. From an activity perspective, interestingly, three and seven are more similar than KLK1 is, are, than, than they are to KLK1, even though that's not mirroring what the structural similarity is. I do want to point out these are the inactive precursors. They have not yet been cleaved. They have not yet been made active. It would be interesting to look at how the structures of KLK1, 3, and 7 may change when they're activated, may change when they're cleaved, may change when they move into the active conformation for doing their serine protease-like activity. On that topic, my second quick application note is we looked at chymotrypsinogen and the active form, which is alpha chymotrypsin. Here's an overlay of the ribbon diagrams, which the uh, active site is also modeled uh, in the middle. So you can kind of see where that catalytic triad of 
serine, histidine, and aspartic acid are located. It's also worth noting there's only a four amino acid difference between the inactive form of chym chymotrypsinogen and the active form of alpha chymotrypsin. What's that pathway look like? Basically what's happening is there are two dipeptides that are being cleaved out as part of that activation pathway. So the active form alpha chymotrypsinogen is only four amino acids different than chymo alpha chymotrypsin is only four amino, difference, amino acids different than chymotrypsinogen, but it also is three independent peptide chains or polypeptide chains that are coming together to form the active molecule. Let's go ahead and dive in. These are what the, the ribbon diagrams for the two molecules look like. Let's go ahead and look at their structures on MMS or their higher order structure. Again, you can see it's clear, it's easy to see there are structural differences between chymotrypsinogen in blue and the alpha chymotrypsin in red. This is again that second derivative, which highlights the differences. You can see differences in the turn region. You can see some small differences in the beta sheet and alpha helical regions as well. Overall, the structural changes are small, but easily measurable, easily statistically significant when looking on MMS because of our high repeatability. Overall, there's about a 10% spectral difference between the two proteins. That's based on an area of overlap measurement on the second derivative or similarity plot that we're looking at here. A couple of other conclusions from that small little study. Just the removal of two dipeptides, the removal of four amino acids, resulted in about a 10% spectral change overall between those two molecules. Change was easily measured and statistically significant on MMS. And some of the specifics, alpha chymotrypsin has about 6% higher turn content and slightly lower beta sheets unordered and helical content. So the active molecule, slightly more turns, and a little bit lower of the other three secondary structural elements. And those small structural changes are responsible for all of the uh, activity changes between the inactive chymotrypsinogen and the active alpha chymotrypsin molecule. It's really highlighting the importance of small structural changes and how that may play a role in a protein's function or a protein's activity. One last mini case study looking at BSA, and it's a batched batch and a vendor to vendor comparison of different, different lots of BSA. And what the study was really focusing on was the activity of that BSA in this assay that this company was looking, that this company was generating or this company had on the market. We were looking at 15 different samples. There was one reference sample that had known activity. And when this vendor approached us, what they said is, we have a small problem. Not all of the different samples that we're getting from different vendors or all of the different lots that we're getting from the same vector, same vendor are equally active. We need a way of understanding why some lots are more active than other lots or some vendors have higher activity, higher active protein than other vendors without actually building assays around it. They wanted a structural assessment of activity as opposed to an activity assay for screening out which BSA samples were the best ones for them to move forward with in their manufacturing process. Diving into the data, I'm showing a delta plot and I'm showing a stability plot in this case. What's pretty quickly apparent is that there are two different families of BSAs. There's all these samples, and then there's the reference, which is right in the middle, and then there's four other BSA lots, which are quite similar to that, or sorry, five other BSA, lot, BSA lots, which are quite similar to that reference material and very different than all of the other samples. At this point, we don't have any answer key. We don't know from an activity perspective, which were more active, which were less active. We just clearly see that they're falling in two populations. Population one, which is similar to the reference, and population two, which is less similar to the reference. The st stability plot tracks individual wave numbers, individual wave regions. And what we can see in our reddish orangish color is the alpha helical trace. 
And you can see that there are these points that are higher up that are all similar in their alpha helical content. And then there's this second family, which are all similar to themselves with their alpha helical content, but very different than the reference molecule and very different than these other ones, which are similar to the reference molecule. We then presented this information back to our customer. They then gave us the answer key. And what, was, what came out of it was that the samples that were in blue that are most similar from a structural perspective overall to the reference had the highest activity. The ones in white, which were all less than 98% similar, though not much less, but all less than 98% similar to the reference molecule did not have the desired activity. So in this case, it's just barely over a 2% overall change in structure that is causing a measurable difference in the activity in the activity assay that this uh, company was testing, that this company was generating. So the five samples that have 98, almost 99% structural similarity to the reference were active. Those with less than 98% similarity were all inactive. What did that do? What, what did, just to show the higher order structure as well, this is the overall higher order structure. If we zoom in, because these are very small changes, again, we see those same five molecules with the highest alpha helical percentage. We see those same five molecules with the lowest unordered percentage, lowest random coil. Those are the active species of BSA. All these other ones with higher percentages of unordered and slightly lower, sorry, slightly lower percentages of helical content we're all inactive. To kind of wrap it up and get us around to the questions center of things, again, MMS is part of your biophysical toolbox. It goes alongside a lot of other tools and techniques that you may be using in your lab that many labs are using for doing structural characterization, for doing analytical biophysical characterization work. MMS add the secondary structural component to all of these other tools. It's much more user-friendly than the historical techniques of CD and FTIR. And it really gives you a lot more sensitivity and it allows you to measure your molecules under the conditions which you care about, which are the, the yeah, conditions under which it's active, the conditions under which it's formulated, the conditions under which you really want to understand what your molecule is looking at because that's where it's behaving. What are some of the advantages? Really time, throughput, ease of use, and the earlier you can understand the structural information about your protein, the quicker you can de-risk it, the quicker you can move or remove products, remove candidates that aren't gonna be successful, and you'll be able to make your quality decisions more confidently and earlier in the process. With that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions that may have come in. Thank you, Dr. Sloan. That was an excellent presentation. Very cutting edge technology there at Redshift Bio. Congratulations on all your scientific advancements with the instrumentation and technology. We will go ahead and jump right into the questions. We have a good one here from Courtney Hazelton Harrington. Courtney asks, Chymotrypsinogen is a fairly small protein with a molecular weight of only about 25 kilodaltons. Is this data analysis workflow as simple for larger molecules like a monoclonal antibody, which averages about 150 kilodaltons? Great question. I appreciate that. And it did dawn on me that I didn't include, include any monoclonal antibody data. The, the slight irony of the question is that the vast majority of the work that our users are doing and that we do is on monoclonal antibodies. So the answer is absolutely yes. We do a lot of IgG work. I'll tell you, we've also recently run some samples that were IgMs, so about five times the size of IgGs. So we really can go to very large proteins. And while she didn't ask, I'll also say it, we've also done some really interesting peptide work as well especially work looking at some helical peptides, which are kind of a struggle um, with some other tools. So it's really, we can work on very small molecules. We can work on very large molecules. So I, I appreciate you pointing that out and asking that question. Thank you. Great, 
Thanks for that answer. Glad to hear you can work on the big stuff too. We have a question from, if, forgive me if I mispronounce this name, Marcarius Cataromunda. Marcarius is asking, or he says he didn't get the principle of operation of MMS. And what is the actual laser technology that's used? Okay, so what we're doing is there's a, a QCL or a quantum cascade laser. The laser is sweeping across the amide one region, which is roughly 1600 to 1700 wave numbers. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the absorbance of all of the materials in the sample in that wave region. And then what the software does is it calculates or really um, generates the differential absorbance between your sample and the buffer in which it's contained. Then after we have that differential absorbance, what we're basing our analysis on is many years of IR spectroscopy data looking at very well characterized samples, very well known samples to understand which different secondary structural elements are absorbing at the different wave numbers or wave regions across the amide one band. Great. I hope that helps clarify. And if not, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to have a conversation with you on that topic. Great. Thanks for that answer, David. And the next question is another really good one from Courtney. I'll just ask it word for word. It says here, you reference FTIR and speak to the benefits of MMS versus FTIR but does MMS still offer significant benefits compared to ATR-FTIR and other fancier FTIR workflows that aren't constrained by stringent concentration limits? Yeah, great question. Uh, ATR or kind of the solid crystals that people are doing for FTIR is a very common tool. It's a way of slightly increasing the, um, uh, the path length of the FTIR, which is normally limited to a relatively narrow path length because of liquid absorbance. Still really the big advantage or one of the big advantages to MMS is we can look at significantly lower concentrations. What I'm told is most people who are doing FTIR or ATR, FTIR are still looking at about five mg per mil or higher concentrations. We are able to go significantly lower than that. There's also, really quite a big um, uh, usability perspective of it as well. There was a study that was done by KBI, which was comparing MMS to FTIR and also to CD. And because of the automation, it was just much quicker to run through a large number of samples on MMS um, uh, because it's completely automated. You don't need to add your sample, take your spectra, clean up your ATR crystal, add your sample, take and take your background, spe background spectrum and move on. So it is the automation of the real-time referencing along with the ability to run lower sample concentrations that give a lot of advantages to MMS. Mm -hmm. Great, appreciate that answer. And let me just remind everybody, we've got a few minutes left. If y'all wanna type in a question into the chat box, I'll be happy to get to it. Let me just ask a quick question here, Dr. Sloan. How much optimization of the parameters are needed before measuring each sample or spectrum? That's a great question. I do appreciate that. One of the, one of the other major advantages is MMS functions in most, if not all of the biologically relevant buffers that we've tested. So there's very minimal if any optimization is required there's very minimal, if any, buffer exchange that needs to be done. You can run the molecule under the conditions where it's interesting to you. You can run the molecules as it's been stored in minus 80s, thawed and run it. If it's high concentration, that's fine. If it's low concentration, that's fine. If it's in a complex formulation buffer, if it's in a simple PBS, if it has histidine, if it has arginine, if it has other exotic excipients, if it has a, a polysorbates or tweens, not a problem. You don't really need to make any optimizations. You don't need to make any methodology changes. All you need is you need your sample. You need the buffer that the sample's in. 
and then you load it into your plate and you go. There's not a lot of work that you need to do to get up and running and run the sample. And well, while I've talked about automation a lot and I've talked about throughput a lot, even if you just have one sample or two samples, that's fine too. You can put just a couple samples in your plate, hit the go back, hit the go button and kind of sit there and watch your data generate as well. It's not only for high throughput walk away automation. You can also sit there and get your data essentially in real time as well. That's great. And you mentioned buffers several times, but are there any buffers that are typically found in protein formulations that might be incompatible with MMS? Really, no, not any biologically relevant buffers. Um, we don't love super high pHs, so pH 10 kind of isn't our favorite concentration, isn't our favorite condition, but not a lot of people are putting their proteins, are putting their samples at really high pHs. We can work with all of the all of the common formulation buffers. We can also work with chemical denaturants as well. We've done studies with guanidinium hydrochloride. We've done studies with urea. So you can test chemical denaturation as well on the system. So the short answer or maybe the long answer is no. We're really compatible with all of the biologically relevant buffers that people have brought to us that people have run on the system. Great. Well, regarding other limitations, I mean, can you tell me, is there a minimum or maximum size for the proteins that you can analyze? We, we really haven't found, um, we've, we've run short peptides. Um, we've run insulin, which is a small peptide. That may well be the smallest thing that we've run on there. As From a size perspective, I, I didn't talk about it and there's not a lot of information that I can share, but we have had customers that have brought us AAV samples as well. So we have looked at AAVs and they're, they're mega Daltons, they're huge. And it's not a problem. We were able to look at AAV samples. We, we've done some work with nucleic acids. There's a robust nucleic acid absorbance in the amide one region as well. So we can look at a very wide diversity of molecules. And as long as it fits, as long as it fits through our microfluidic channel, which is 25 microns, which is really big from a molecular perspective, from a molecular scale, we've been very successful at looking at small, large protein, nucleic acid, virus, a lot of different things with MMS. That's fantastic. And since we're on the topic of limits of the technology, what are the upper and lower protein concentration limits? Right. So the I gave two numbers. What we usually say is if you want to measure the higher order structure, if you really want to understand what are the percentages of helices and sheets and turns, our lower limit of protein is about 0.5 mg per ml. If you want to just make a comparison, spe comparison spectroscopically, if you wanted to say, does this spectrum or fingerprint look like this other spectrum or fingerprint, we can go a bit lower. We can go down to about 0.1 mg per ml. So we can go a little bit lower. It's just harder to get accurate higher order structure calculations at the extremely low end. We say we go up to about 200 mg per ml. We've gone higher in some cases. The reason we kind of say a 200 mg per, L, mg per ml limit is we do have a maximum viscosity of about 20 CP, which, which is a pretty thick solution, but we have a maximum viscosity of about 20 CP because we are fluidic technology. We are flowing in the system and generally protein or antibody solutions are getting close to that 20 CP perspective when you're up at about 200 mg per ml. If you had a magical excipient that lowered the viscosity, or if your particular protein or MAB of interest doesn't get syrupy at 200 mg per ml, we actually have done a few cases where we went higher than 200 mg per ml. But I generally say the functional range and let's say casual conversation is about 0.1 mg per ml up to about 200 mg per ml. Great. Sounds like a very workable range. And I know that a lot of the people on the call right now are interested. Do you actually demo your system? We, we do. We do do demos. There, there's two ways. If people are interested, we're happy to have a conversation with you and understand what, what they're looking to do, what, what their study is all about. We don't usually like to just look at one sample. We like to have a couple of samples so we can highlight change or highlight what might be going on between those samples. 
In some cases, we will do a demo in your lab if you need to, if you can't ship proteins to us. In other cases, you can send materials to us. And if you want to come and visit us in our home outside of Boston, we're happy to have you, give you a tour, run samples there, and kind of go through the data with you. But we're happy to demonstrate it. And for those people who just have a project that they need to run, we, we also run a service business as well. So if you want to sell, send us samples, we do have a per sample cost. We're happy to run data for you, deliver data back to you, and function kind of as a, a CRO or kind of a, an extension of your research organization as well. Yeah, and that leads right into the next question, actually. Marcarius is also asking, what is the cost of your service or an analysis of the sample? Since, the, since there are people from lots of different regions and lots of different places, I'd rather handle that question offline. So please, please reach out to me and I'm happy to get you pricing specific to your currency, your region, or wherever you may, you may, wherever you may be doing your research. But I appreciate the question. Sounds good, Dr. Sloan. Our timing's perfect here. I, that was the last question. We'll go ahead and wrap it up. First, I want to thank all the attendees. We had a great turnout today. We appreciate your time and realize you're calling in from other parts of the world where it may not be real convenient for you. Dr. Sloan, I want to thank you as our speaker and congrats to you and the team at Redshift Bio on all your success and the wonderful technology that you presented today. You got to be very proud and I think the future is very bright for, for y'all at Redshift. And then finally, I just want to thank my colleague and good friend, Max Bleckham at Sinobiological for setting up and executing this uh, lock and key webinar today pretty much flawlessly. And also, I want to appreciate the plug that you gave us also, Dr. Sloan, on the calicrins as well that Sino provided. I mean, that was very nice of you and glad you liked the quality and the selection and the price point. So that's good as well. It was a pleasure working with you. Thank you much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And with that, we'll adjourn. Thanks again, everybody, and good night or good afternoon to you.